Hey there nation, welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Chiefskate, and we are back with another edition of Wapocalypse Now. This is a series of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Path to Glory campaign, and this one is purely fought between orcs and goblins, and, uh, and that's all the war bands that we have in this one, so it's kind of like a fun little game that we're playing with my friends and I. On this battle report, my friend Scream of the Emo is bringing the Crooked Moons, his Gloom Spike Gits warband, versus yours truly with my depth. People Eat is my Bone Splitters Warband. So this one's kind of an interesting one because it is a championship game right now. Well, not really so much a championship game. It's just that we've taken the two warbands that have won their last scenarios and they're fighting against each other for the very first time. So it'd be kind of interesting to see exactly how it stacks up. I'm pretty excited to see what happens because I saw what these Gloom Spike Gits can do and I want to see if I can take these guys on. So with that being said, we're going to play some background music real quick. If you want to see exactly what each of the warbands is bringing, go ahead and pause and take a look at your own leisure. So with that being said, let's get this battle report on a roll. Krom, I've never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. No one, not even you will remember if we were good men or bad, why we fought or why we died. No, all that matters is that two stood against many. That's what's important. Barlow pleases you, Kram. So grant me one request. Grant me revenge. And if you do not listen, then the hell with you. All right, so with the uh, army list over with, let's go and talk about the scenario rules real quick. This one is called the Vendetta, is the name of the scenario. Pretty much what ends up happening is that both sides have 24 inch deployment zones. So there is no real dead space between the deployment zones from both sides. Uh, pretty much what happens is that each side picks one unit and that unit is the Vendetta unit. They are the unit that is here to prove something and why to kill the other opponent's Vendetta unit. Uh, one of the benefits of course is that that Vendetta unit that you pick is immune to battle shock, which is kind of nice in this case. And aside from that, normal victory conditions do apply. As you can see, my friend and I are playing on a 4x4 table, so let's go ahead and talk about the deployment for this one. Alright, so let's go ahead and start with Scream of the Emos, Gloom Spike gets the Crooked Moon. So over in the top left hand corner is where he decided to deploy. Right in the middle of his deployment area he has his Loon Shrine, right there represented by the classic Loon Shrine that was available from the Battle of Skull Pass uh, box set from way back when. On the left hand side, kind of partially hidden by that brewery is Skarsnik and Gobla, the Warlord of the Eight Peaks. That is the special character that's also the general for this army. Right next to him on the right hand side in his black robes and red hat, that is the Shrinkin' Shroomhead, which is a, uh, an, uh, a shaman, I believe it's called a Madcap Shaman, is what the name of the unit is for the Gloom Spike Gits. On the right hand side is a unit of 15 Shudas, those are Night Goblins armed with short bows, and then right in front of them are the uh, Bone Breakers, which is a unit of 10 Squigs with two herders included in that unit. And deploy on the far right hand side between that row house as well as the Slime River is his Death Creepers. That's a unit of five Spider Fang Spider Riders. And uh, that pretty much makes the deployment on the right hand flank. And finally set off to the side in the top left hand corner of the top of that tower. Um, as you can see that green circle. That green circle is the template that we're using for the Bad Moon to show what direction that moon will be uh, traveling through throughout the battle report. Also on the top there is the Rekkas and that is a unit of three uh, uh, fanatic loon smashes. Uh, they're just brought to the side now because right now they're currently in hiding in one of my friend's uh, Gloom Spike Gits units. And that pretty much rounds up deployment for Scream of the Emo. Alright, so now it's time for my deployment for my Bone Splitters. As you can see here, they're all located in the same deployment area. I keep my army pretty tight knit because uh, the battalions kind of uh, benefit from the uh, close interaction with the characters in this unit. So on the left hand side, that is the Raka Raka. Uh, sorry, not the Waka Raka, that's the Waka Waka. That's my unit of 10 Savage Oryx armed with uh, Savage Stickers. Right next to them on the right hand side, that is the Raka Raka, that is a unit of 10 Savage Orox just armed with Chompas. And on the far right hand side, that is my Tifruk Battalion. Those are the Stabas Dabas, which are my two big Savage Orox big Stabas looking in that unit as well. Right behind the main battle lines is the Twang Twang, which is my unit of 10 Savage Orc Arrow Boys. And then right behind them is my uh, General, which is Warzag, the Great Green Prophet, as well as a little Cave Squig. And I forgot to mention, right in the middle between the three squads of Savage Orox, that is Papa Shango, my Savage Orox Big Boss. And that pretty much makes a deployment for this one. So with the deployment over with, we go directly to the top of turn number one, and my friend Screaming the Emo and I roll for deployment to see who goes first. 
All right, so we managed to take the initiative on this one. So because that turn one goes directly to the bone splitters, and the first thing I do in my hero phase, I cast Mystic Shield with Warzag, the Great Green Prophet. I decided to put that spell onto my uh, Waka Waka there on the left hand side because my spear wielding Savage Oryx are our closest to the enemy units at that point. I decided to keep my command point that I got from this trade, not use my command ability from my. Uh, from my uh, Savage Big Boss uh, because I'm not within range of any close combat yet. But at the same time though, I do activate my uh, command, uh, my uh, Baton ability for my Cunning Rucks, so that way I can move one of my four units forward. As you can see in the Hero Phase, the Cunning Ruck ability does allow any Savage Oryx unit within 10 inches of my Big Boss to be either, either move, shoot, or pile an attack. In this case, I decided to tap my rack a -rack and decided to move them up 5 inches in a normal movement range. And the reason why is because I want them to get closer to those Spider Riders because the Spider Riders are within a really good distance. Once I move normally and then charge next and they're in the charge phase, I'll be able to gauge those guys and get them to close combat and hopefully finish those guys off. So with the Hero Phase over with, we go directly to the Movement Phase. And here's an overhead shot of the entire battlefield. Now I do apologize, I forgot to take a picture of the battle plan the last time uh, we did the beginning of the battle report. Pretty much my opponent is stationed up in the left hand corner, so my idea is to try to kind of surround him with my units of Savage Aurochs. So I start doing exactly that. The first thing I do is I move up the Raka Raka up to the ruins there in the top of the, uh, the, of the battlefield. The plan is to sweep over to the right hand flank through the Slime River and attack those Spider Riders in the right hand flank and hopefully I can surround his units by coming from behind them. At the same time I also move up the Waka Waka, which is my unit of 10 Savage Oryx armed with st uh, sp uh, spears. I move them right to the middle of the Slime River to act as a buffer for my left hand flank while the rest of my minions move forward. Um, I don't really advance with anybody, I just do normal movement. I move the Twang Twang as well as Papa Shango right there in the center. Right behind them is Warzad, the Great Green Prophet, and then right behind them on the right hand side, that is the Stavis Stavis. And the only reason why I move up to their normal inches is that way they can charge during the charge phase if they need to, or I can shoot during the shooting phase with my units. And that pretty much makes up my move phase on this one. And here's a close of my army, getting into position, taking up defensive positions, that way I can defend my left flank while at the same time charging into screen with the Emo's right hand flank and destroying his army that way. So with the movement phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. And in the shooting phase, the Twang Twang take careful aim with their bows and open up on the Death Creepers. In the end, I managed to kill two of those Spider Riders and inflict the Floating Wound onto the third one. Which is kind of nice because I've kind of softened up these guys for close combat when I send in the Raka Raka during the charge phase. And speaking of the charge phase, I charged in my rack rack with no problem whatsoever. When I rolled my d6 rolls, I think I rolled an 11, and plus they get the plus 2 inches for their uh, Bone Thumper ability, so because of that they travel a full 13 inches. I just need to get within 10 of those guys, so that way I was within range. And as you can see, my guys have no problem piling around that unit of Spider Riders, no problem. So with the charge phase over with, we go directly to the combat phase. And in the combat, as well as the following battle shock phases, I pretty much just wiped out that unit in close combat. There was no real need for a battle shock test because uh, my opponent never got the chance to survive and to attack back. It was pretty much a clean kill for my army. So with the combat phase and battle shock phase over with, we go directly to the bottom of turn number one for the gloom spike gets. So that takes us to the bottom of turn number one for the Gloom Spike gets. And the first thing that my friend Scream of the Emo does is roll his D6 to see if the Bad Moon moves, in which case it moves forward one quadrant up, so that way his corner of the table has the uh, Doom as the uh, Bad Moon effects going off for his army. Which is pretty bad for me because that means his army gets a bunch of bonuses for it because uh, that's what Gloom Spike gets do. But then again, you know, it's just kind of the thing you have to go through when you're fighting against those kind of armies because, you know, them's the breaks. So that being said, we go directly to the top of the hero phase. And during Scream of the Emo's hero phase, the first thing he does is he spends his command ability of Warlord of the Eight Peaks, and he decides to use that against his uh, Bone Breakers, which is a unit of uh, Squigs. What that does is it allows you to pile in as well as attack twice in the combat phase, which could prove pretty deadly because since the Bad Mood is in this quad of the table, that means that these Squigs have what's what's called a Loon Squigs ability, which means they can both run as well as charge in the same turn. So that unit is extremely dangerous right now. Not to mention, he also taps his Madcap Shaman and he casts a spell called Night Shroud on that unit as well, which means they're minus one to hit in close combat. So now these Squigs can, charge, uh, can run and charge in the same turn. They can also fight and pile in twice in the same combat phase, and they're minus one to hit. So that's a pretty deadly unit I really have to watch out for. So with the hero phase over with, we go directly to the uh, movement phase. 
And during the move phase, um, he doesn't really do much movement for the most part. Most of his army stays exactly where it's at next to that Loon Shrine, which also makes sense because they also receive bonuses from that uh, from that terrain piece, including ignoring battle shock tests. But he does move forward his bone breakers and with his uh, squigs there. And as you can see there, he, he also ran them forward too. I think they ran forward like 10 inches in total. So as you can see, they went around that standing stone boulder situation, and they're a perfect range to charge directly at my Raka Racket, which is located on the right hand side, right in the middle of the Slime River. And that could prove to be very deadly for me, uh, de dangerous for me. And the reason why is because that unit can pile in and attack twice in the same turn. So that's pretty dangerous. Here's a close-up of the Bone Breakers getting ready to charge directly into the Raka Raka. And there's a close-up of Scream of the Emo's remainder of his army just sitting around that Loon Shrine, just you know, gathering bonus points as much as they possibly can. So with the move phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. And the first thing that Scream of the Emo does is take his uh, Ludas, which is a unit of 15 Shootas, and they open up on the Waka Waka. Unfortunately for me, uh, my opponent, though, he was only able to cause one wound, which is not such a big deal for me because uh, my Savage Aurochs have two wounds apiece. Now, the reason why his shooting was so ineffective was because, unfortunately for him, um, he has to roll fives to hit as well as five to wounds, and so because of that, a third of his shots are only going to make it through at any one time. So because of that, he got that one wound off, and so... But then again, he doesn't really need it. And the reason why he doesn't really need it is because you go directly to the charge phase. And then the charge phase, he sends in his bone breakers directly into my Waka Waka. So because of that, my Savage Orcs Armor Spears are now engaged in close combat with these Cave Squigs. So with the charge phase over with, we go directly to the combat phase. And as you can see in this photo, after the combat and battle shock phases, it was an absolute slaughter for my Waka Waka. In the end, I only had two Savage Aurochs Armor Spears survive it. What ended up happening is that those Mangler Squigs got to pile in and attack twice, and by doing so, they managed to kill, I believe, five of my Savage Aurochs that they did, which is actually, you know, a pretty decent amount of damage that was done. But the problem was when I rolled for my bravery test, I just rolled out of the box. I think I rolled like a six. So because of that, I do lose three more members of my spear totem uh, savage oryx, leaving only two of them. So that was absolutely devastating to see that happen. In exchange, I was only able to cause one wound onto one of the squigs. But then again, the cave squigs also carry two wounds apiece. So, you know, not much was really done in that case. So with the battle shock as well as the combat phase is over with, we go directly to the top of turn number two. And we roll off for initiative to see who goes first. Alright, so that takes us directly to the top of turn number two for the Gloom Spike gets. My friend Scream of the Emo managed to steal the initiative on this one. So the very first thing he does, of course, is roll for his Bad Moon to see exactly where that uh, template goes. Uh, he does roll forward, so right as you can see in that photo, that green template is right in the middle of the battlefield. That means now the entire battlefield is now suffering from the effects of the of the, uh, of the Bad Moon. Which means kind of negatives for me, but kind of bonuses for him at the same time. So the first thing he does is that he actually uses an ability called Bangs of the, butt of the Bad Moon. And what you do is you roll a D6 and you pick an enemy unit. If that D6 roll is higher than number of models that's left in the unit, you roll a D3 to see how many uh, mortal wounds you cause. In which case he does use that ability to target my last remaining uh, Savage Oryx right there with their spears. During the hero phase, he also casts his Night Shroud onto his Ludas to make sure they're minus one to hit against uh, in case anybody should try to shoot them or engage them in close combat. At the same time, he also spends his command point for putting the Warlord of the Eight Peaks ability onto those shooters that way they can pile in and attack twice if they have to. So with the move hero phase over with, we go directly to the movement phase. And as you can see in this photo, um, he once again sends those Mangler Squigs, uh, not Mangler Squigs, I'm sorry, starts sending those Cave Squigs forward again. Um, he actually just moves them like a normal distance across the Slime River, which puts them in a perfect flanking position to attack my General Wurzag, the Great Green Prophet, by attacking him from behind. So now I'm realizing now, realizing now that my whole entire backfield is now vulnerable to attack from these Cave Squigs. Which is pretty devastating because these guys are pretty deadly. At the same time, my friend also decides to pop his fanatics. So because of that, the Rekkas move out of the uh, goblin unit that are hiding in. I think they moved up, I think, six or seven inches away from them. Uh, they're kind of obscured by that pile of rocks, but in the close-up post pictures, you'll see them. What he decides to do is he decides to take his Loon Smash of Fanatics and move him directly towards my Raka Raka, which is on the top of the screen there, right between the Slime River as well as that row of houses. And that could be pretty devastating because each of those Fanatics is packing D6 hits and their damage is due D3 wounds, so it could be pretty devastating if I'm not careful. Here's a close-up of his Loon Smash um, Fanatics getting ready to charge directly into the Raka Raka. And here's a close-up of his Cave Squeeze getting ready to charge into my army. And since there is no real movement phase and nothing's in, in range from the shootout, we go directly to the charge phase. 
And the first thing he decides to do is to charge forward with his cave squigs from the bone breakers, and they have no problem whatsoever getting in the charge distance to surround Warzag, the great green prophet. So this is going to be bad because even though Warzag is a powerful wizard, he's not really good in combat, and he's about to get eaten alive by a massive horde of uh, cave squigs. So that was pretty rough. At the same time, our friend Scream of the Emo also charges in his three Loon Smasher fanatics from the Rekkas, and they go directly into the Raka Raka. So those guys will be engaged in close combat as well. And speaking of close combat, we go directly to the combat as well as the Battle Shock phases. And needless to say, my poor shaman got eaten alive without a moment's hesitation. Uh, cave squigs are pretty deadly. They get two attacks apiece. They get to, I believe, they also get a bonus uh, for rerolling ones. I also think is what they get too because the bad moon is affecting the entire battlefield. So needless to say, where's like the great green prophet got eaten alive by a herd of cave squigs. So that part was pretty devastating. And in the end, the combat. Oh my god. The combat between these Loon Smash and Fanatics against my Raka Raka was absolutely horrible. In the end, I lost nine. Once again, I lost nine <laughs> Savage Oryx in that close combat with these Fanatics. I managed to pop one of the Fanatics and managed to kill him, but it doesn't really do much good though because during the Battle Shock phases, Fanatics have a leadership of 10, so they don't go anywhere. And of course, if I just roll a one, my guy ends up going away, and that's exactly what happens. So I lose my Raka Raka, I lose my Waka Waka, so my two close combat units are gone, and just like that I am now starting to be afraid of glue spike gets. I can just see how devastating these guys can be under the right circumstances. So with that we go directly to the bottom turn number two for the bone splitters. At this point I'm realizing I'm losing my army very very quickly to some really like small units so I gotta do some quickly quick. Um, so the very first thing I do is of course I spend a command ability from my Papa Shango. I use his savage attack command ability on my big stabbers. What ends up happening is when you roll a d6 die and you roll a 6 or more when you're fighting in close combat, then it generates additional attacks for your unit, which could be pretty helpful because my big stabbers are the only ones I could really use in close combat against these cave squigs. At the same time, I also use my Cunning Rook Battalion ability on the Twang Twang. I turn those guys around have them open fire with their bows against those Cave Squigs during the Hero Phase. Luckily for me, I do actually wound quite a bit on that unit. I managed to kill two more Cave Squigs, but at the same time though, um, I still gotta worry about fighting these guys in close combat, which could prove to be very dangerous. So with the uh, Hero Phase over with, we go directly to the Movement Phase. And as you can see, movement is not all that dramatic. The only major move that takes place is the move of Papa Shango, as well as my Stabba Stabba's over to the right-hand flank of those Cave Squigs, because I need to kill those guys like yesterday, and that's what I plan on doing to them. So with the movement phase over with, we go directly to the shooting phase. And in the shooting phase, I open up with my bows again, and manage to kill two more Cave Squigs, which is pretty awesome, which means that the, the, main, the Bone Breakers have now taken four uh, deaths to this unit, which could prove to be very, very important later on during the Battle Shock phase. During the charge phase, I send in both in Papa Shango as well as the Stavis Deva. They have no problem whatsoever making the charge against this unit. So because of that, uh, my Stavis Deva Stav as well as Papa Shango will be able to fight this Cave Squig unit in the combat phase. And as you can see in this photo, my big Stavis had no problem whatsoever just wiping out that unit off the face of the planet. It was a combination of effect of both from my... Um, my two big stabbers, as well as Papa Shango. Um, unfortunately for my friend Scream of the Emo, when he rolled for his counterattacks, he wasn't able to really cause any damage to my units, so that part was kind of neat. But at the same time, though, I managed to wipe that unit off of existence, which was really helpful for me. So with that being said, we go directly to the top of turn number three, and we roll off for initiative to see who goes first. And unfortunately for me, but good for my friend, Screamo Emo managed to take the initiative on this one for turn number three. When he rolls his d6 to see if the bad moon moves at all, it actually ends up staying right in the middle of the battlefield, which means the entire battlefield is being affected by the effects of the bad moon. So during the hero phase, he really doesn't much do much of anything. I didn't change up that placard because I didn't really see the point to. But what he decides to do is he decides not to spend his command point to use his command ability as Ludas because I'm simply too far away. But he does cast Night Shroud with the Shrink and Shroom Head onto the Ludas, so those guys are now minus one to hit, which is a pretty smart idea because the only thing I have right now are missile troops, and that'll be the only thing that'll be able to touch him in the next turn once I start moving my forces towards his main battle lines. However, my friend does use the Fangs of the Bad Moon ability from the Kiro phase, and he has it target one of my Stavis Stavis because I only have two units in that in that battalion. So he managed to cast three mortal wounds onto one of my big Stavis, which was unfortunate for me because that was pretty tough. So with the Hero phase over with, we go directly to the Boomba phase. 
So during the movement phase, my friend Screaming the Emo decides to keep his bosses and his characters as well as his Ludas directly right where they're at, right next to the Loon Shrine. But he does move up his fanatics, and those guys rocket across the battlefield, rolling an 11. So they manage to get past the Slime River right to the other side, and they're right directly behind my Twang Twang, which is actually pretty bad because if they manage to charge directly into the Twang Twang, they could chew them up in close combat. Here's a close up of the Rekkas, those Loon Smasher Goblins getting ready to charge directly into the Twang Twang. And when you know it, my friend managed to roll like I think a 7, so because of that turn the charge phase, uh, the two fanatics from the Rekkas managed to charge directly into the Twang Twang, and now I gotta fight these guys in close combat. Needless to say, combat does not go well for me as you can see in this photo. In the end, he was able to kill 8. Once again, he was able to kill 8 of my goblins which is the amount of attacks these guys had. I forgot what ungodly number of dice he rolled. I think he rolled like 12. 12 hits is when he ended up rolling. And I think of those 12 hits, I think 10 or 11 managed to hit and then when he rolled all the damage, it was, it was just ostentatious and just really bad. Needless to say, it just wiped out that unit like it was nobody's business. And at that point, it just kind of crushed my spirit at that point when I saw that because I knew there was no way I was going to be able to bounce back from this and actually win the game. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, that takes us directly to the end of the game. And the reason why is because I have nothing to fight with. Uh, because I've been either, one, eaten alive by cave squigs, or two, smushed into a nice, fine, lime green paste by a bunch of fanatics. And so at this point, I decided to call the game, and my friend Scream the Emo managed to win the scenario. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we go directly to the post-game, because this battle report is now officially over. Alright, so going to the post game, starting with the people eat us because I lost. Um, I managed to get one glory point out of it. That brings my total pool of glory points up to four points, which is pretty nice. In the end, I decided to roll on the followers table and managed to get ten more Savage Auric Arrow Boys for the Twang Twang. So now I'll be able to increase that unit from ten up to twenty, which means that I'm going to have to get my paintbrush ready and start painting up my other ten Arrow Boys for my Warband. So, pretty, you know... It's pretty fair. It was my first loss so far in this campaign, and it kind of makes sense because, you know, these Gloom Spike gets, man, they are no joke. And finally, for my friend Screaming the Emo of the Crooked Moons, he managed to win two glory points on this one, so he gets a grand total of five glory for the campaign. He's halfway there to actually winning the campaign. In the end, for the followers table, he decided to take three more Loon Smasher Fanatics because why not? That unit is pretty, pretty deadly, so I would do exactly the same thing if I was him as well. Well, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for this one. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us, as always. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Google+. Plus. Well, Google+, Plus, as long as it's around, because I just got the, the notice that's going away. Or blogger.com for the latest and greatest news about the hobby side of what we're working here at our channel. That's good to do it for this one, you guys. We will catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.